experiencing in Eskimo Point. Today, however, we are celebrating Walter's legacy. Because while he was working for the government, and particularly after he began his consultating process with Aboriginal groups, he generated and collected a vast amount of archival and published material relating to Aboriginal <coughs> rights, land, education, and health, among other topics. And this is what we are celebrating today. So I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Joanne Kesselman, who is Vice President Academic <coughs> and Provost at the University of Manitoba, to um, give us some opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Shelley, and good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to home Homecoming 2012 at the University of Manitoba. Let me begin by thanking uh, uh, Gary, Elder Gary Robson, for your words this morning. I think uh, very appropriate. I um, I was expecting to see uh, Michael uh, Michael uh, Robertson, who's a member of our Board of Governors here today, but I can't see him here, so I don't believe he's here. But if I'm missing him, I do want to extend him a welcome. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In fact, the university and the forks of the city of Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. As Shelley has already mentioned, we are here today to celebrate the donation of the Walter Rudnicki Collection to the University of Manitoba. And we are proud and honored to house this immensely valuable collection of archival records and books. We're also here to celebrate the contributions that this distinguished University of Manitoba alumnus made to our country. In this community of learning, discovery, and engagement, this collection holds great importance. It reveals the character of Walter Rudnicki, who played a key supporting role to the Indigenous people of Canada. He was a defender, challenger, and as the elder has said, an ally. The Rudnicki Fall covers government policies on Aboriginal rights as well as Aboriginal people's responses to these policies during the critical period between the 1950s and 2010. The impact of this collection is far reaching. Students have the opportunity to gain a thorough overview of Aboriginal rights and an understanding of the specific issues, such as forced relocations, starvations at residential schools, all of which have had a deep impact on generations of individuals, families, and communities. As well as providing a broad picture, the collection has specific in-depth information for researchers and scholars. Walter Rudnicki and his consulting company conducted thorough historical research on each issue that he provided advice on, and all of that information and the reports he wrote are gathered here for everyone to access. At the University of Manitoba, we strive to ensure that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit values are acknowledged, embraced, and infused into our life on our campuses. Our university promotes and aspires to build a society where culture and customs of Indigenous peoples are reflected and respected in schools, workplaces, and public institutions. We share with our alumnus, Walter Rudnicki, the belief that in leading through action, we are making our university and our country a better community for everyone. We are at the dawn of a new partnership where we can dream together, learn from each other, and work together. Thank you very much.
Today's homecoming event is to celebrate the life and accomplishments of U of M alumnus Walter Rippey. We are also here to celebrate our students, future, present, and alumni. I view homecoming week at the University of Manitoba as a journey of storytelling, sharing, and remembering all of those trailblazers, mavericks, visionaries, and rebels who have walked these halls in the past. Mr. Riddiki is certainly one of those great individuals who dedicated his life work to improve the lives of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. He walked hand in hand with us and he challenged governments and in fact our society in a time when our collective voices as Indigenous peoples were being unheard. While homecoming focuses on and celebrates the accomplishments of our alumni, it is also a time to welcome fresh inquiring minds, our new students, as well as support all of our returning undergraduate and graduate students. Our U of M students are our next generation of innovators, and challengers, and explorers, and the Walter Riddiki collection will help our students and the public to better understand the history and relationships between Canada and Aboriginal peoples. <coughs> By doing so, we will facilitate the next generation of students to question and challenge the many injustices which continue to exist in our society. I never had the good fortune to know Walter Riddiki, but from what I do know, he dedicated much of his life to improving the lives of Aboriginal peoples of Canada. And I'm confident he would share my belief that the current First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students represent the future and everything the future is. <coughs> I'm also confident Mr. Riddiki will support my view that education is a catalyst for positive change. I believe that education will help transform and empower the lives of our people, communities, and Canada as a whole. The University of Manitoba is committed to support and advance Indigenous achievement. It is our vision to make Manitoba a centre of excellence for education, Indigenous education. We have built a Pathways for Indigenous Achievement that focuses on supporting students, building partnerships and supporting communities, sharing Indigenous knowledge and research, and celebrating our successes as First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. The Walter Riddiki collection touches upon and embraces each one of those four directions. I hope you enjoy our celebration today and please take time to appreciate this very important collection that has been donated to us. Thank you so much. studies of, to document the poor conditions of our housing. 
And uh, so we had not only did written documents and took photographs and so on, we had uh, black and white film. Uh, Patrick Watson was a friend, and he said, take black and white film, because if we don't get the meeting we want, we'll just rent a room across from the convention center at the Royal in the uh, Chapel Laurier, and we'll just loop that black and white film over and over again until you get your meeting. And uh, well, people in those days uh, were going up in smoke on a regular basis. Our people were living on low allowances, using uh, oil barrels and stoves. They overheat, they explode, and talk about the shots and just go up in smoke on a regular basis. Uh, cameramen fell through the floors because uh, they made it their equipment on top of their weight. Uh, it was terrible. And as uh, Walter had already known about the Inuit circumstances uh, because of his previous uh, work at Indian and Northern Affairs, he'd become aware of the situation of the Métis and helped us do this important documentation. We got a meeting with the uh, minister, Ron Basford, and uh, the president of CMAC at the time, uh, uh, Bill Terron. And we presented our case, and we said we had uh, wanted to have a, a policy. We needed a policy from CMAC that would allow, our, uh, allow us to be able to build some new, ho new houses, uh, replace these shacks. And uh, at one point, the minister said, Yes, we're going to give you funding to do this, uh, yeah. uh, develop this policy. We'll develop a policy. And uh, Angus Spence, who was the president of the Manitoba Native Federation at the time, said, well, look, we don't want to, you to just develop a policy and then uh, put it on the table. What if we don't like it? And Bill Terron said, you will be consulted every step of the way in the development of this policy, and I'm appointing Walter Rudnick to head that consultation. So I appointed a team of, of uh, negotiators. He had his team, and they met over the course of a number of weeks. And we developed hammered out a policy. It was a really good one. And in those days, everything was marked confidential, draft <coughs> memorandum, cabinet. We, cartoons, everything. <laughs> it didn't matter. Whatever it was eventually might get to cabinet was marked draft and to cabinet. And so how else would we know what was going to be in this policy unless we could actually see some of that material ourselves? We didn't uh, there were all kinds of parts of the cabinet document that we didn't we, we, we couldn't see. Uh, federal provincial implications and all these other things, Department of Finance uh, comments and so on. But what we wanted to know was what we were going to do, what would this policy do, how would we access the funds, and what would be the end result. So at the end of all of our consultations, so there was one meeting I attended, and Walter was there as well, uh, when we went over the last draft uh, that we were to see, and Walter said, now, uh, there are many sections you can't obviously see, uh, but, and, and we are going to be uh, making amendments to this, but in any event, this is the essence of the policy. You know what the essence of the policy is that we're putting forward. So I called Bill Terron when I got back to my office and uh, told him we were very pleased with the process. Thanked him for uh, appointing Walter. He said, well, if you're really happy with this policy, can you send me a note? Uh, or send a, a note to the minister, because I'm meeting him uh, tomorrow. And it'd be good to, for him to know that how happy you are. So I called him my assistant, and I drafted a, a, a letter and sent it over to uh, Ron Dasford's office. In those days, you just walk up to the hill. And so she took it over and so <laughs> took it to his desk. Uh, the minister's office, and so it was there. Uh, the next afternoon, I got a phone call from Walter, and uh, 
He said, well, thanks a lot, son of a bitch. You got me fired. I said, what? I just couldn't believe it. Oh, Walter, what are you talking about? And, uh, and he was at home. Uh, he'd been summarily marched out of the office. He couldn't do anything. They just called him in, marched him out of the office. He couldn't take anything from his desk or anything. I went over to his place, spent a long evening and together over a lot of scotch. <laughs> and uh, as it turned out, uh, and uh, this story has already been told and written, um, this was getting back at Walter. This was the chief of the Privy Council getting back at Walter. Uh, it's a stain on his uh, work as clerk of the Privy Council. It's a stain on Bill Terrell uh, for what he did. But this is vindication for Walter. I'm telling you a story of just one thing that Walter did. He's an amazing man. Uh, I uh, have been so privileged and gifted to have known of him and to have been his friend. And so thank you to the university for what you're doing to let Walter's work carry on. The work that uh, so desperately is needed. Thank you, Tony. Those uh, words are very powerful and gives a, a fresh insight to uh, what was a sorry incident. Um, I think some of you may know that uh, Walter was actually on a blacklist, an RCMP blacklist, and uh, that this was, uh, I think, also a thinly veiled excuse to uh, get rid of him um, as being a sympathizer to Aboriginal concerns and uh, to left wing. Um, our next uh, speaker is Rosalie Tizia. Uh, she's an advisor to First Nations governments um, and an Indigenous rights advocate. And uh, she has also been a close friend of Walter and Nikki. Rosalie. <coughs> I realized that 
when he saw that, uh, it did something to him. He told me about Eskimo Point, what happened to the Inuit there. He told me about um, how he would when he got his Indian name and his headdress and he had to go into a sweat lodge and when he went to bed that night his spirit traveled out of his body and then he didn't know what had happened but he saw the whole city of Ottawa and he seemed to have this incredible brilliance about him that he could integrate so much of what he had experienced in his life into his being. And it made him the human being that he was. He treated me like a daughter. His wife Simone treated me like a daughter. His children treat me like a sister. And it tells me something about them. When I turned 40 years old, I was looking in the mirror one day and I saw one white hair in my head. <laughs> and he was on the phone and I said, Walt, I found one white hair in my head. He said, well, whoop-dee-doo. <laughs> and it only occurred to me weeks later, of course, he, his hair is all white since he was in his 20s. <laughs> Didn't care about that. And I'm really uh, proud of the fact that I introduced him to Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> You know, one evening we were in this home and uh, this movie came on, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, he said, oh, I don't want to watch it. I said, why? I said, he spoofs violence. He just makes fun of it. And uh, so we started watching this movie and Arnold Schwarzenegger's galloping on a horse into a hotel. And Walt is just falling all over the couch, just laughing really, really hard, and Simon walks in. And she says, oh, that Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's so too violent, and Walt just rocks and laughs really hard all over again, just falling all over the place. And I thought, this is the first time I've really seen him just rock with laughter. And I was so proud of that, that I could do something like that to Walter and Nikki. <laughs> but you know, there is a liberation movement in British Columbia, an Indian liberation movement. And these people don't take any money from any government. They pay for everything themselves. Even when they go to a doctor, they pay the doctor. They don't take medical, they don't take welfare, they don't take anything from government. They live off the land and they know their land implicitly. And these people love Walt so deeply. I remember the last year of Walt's life, he, uh, they were going to have a, a meeting and they would the fundraise a lot. And it was going to be over three days. And they asked me if I could arrange to bring Walter over. So I phoned him up. And at that time, he was already sick. And he wanted to come. And we worked at it, and worked at it, and worked at it, and worked at it. And uh, no one wanted him to come, but he wanted to come. And in the 
end, the doctor said no. But you know, we improvised. I spoke for Walt that day. I know his passion. I know implicitly how he thinks. I know his love for what he did. He always told me if you scratch a Ukrainian, you're going to find an Indian underneath. <laughs> and every time I scratch him, I do find an Indian. <laughs> I don't know what kind of Indian. <laughs> And over time, he's made me the person that I am today. Just by sharing a lot of his stories with me, a lot of what he went through as a human being. He told me about growing up in Winnipeg, going to university, being in the war, meeting Simon, and I always said, the only one that matches intelligence is Simon. The only one in this whole country. I just want to say to the Nikki children, thank you for your love. There are people all over this country who love him and have the deepest and highest respect for him. And that will never change. I'm glad I knew this man. You know, so I walked through looking at a lot of the work. I felt sad because I miss him. And I know the people in the liberation movement miss him too. They're having a meeting next week and they still talk about him. They still want him at their meeting. But he's not here. I remember um, when my sister and I were flying on the plane from Vancouver to Ottawa on the Constitution talks and some of the chiefs had called and said, do you guys want to come? <clears throat> and we didn't in particular want to go. We had just written up uh, Our rights and defending our rights and freedoms a, a guidebook for the for the leadership. And when we were on the plane flying over, we were sent a one-way ticket. By the way, uh, Bill Bennett was on the plane, the Premier of BC, and he opened up a, a book that said for Premier size only. Aboriginal Rights Constitutional Conference. 
and my sister kind of nudged me in the in the side with her elbow because so much of the papers that Walt has we gave to him. We stole those papers a lot in them. <laughs> you can thank the residential school for that. <laughs> So when Bill Bennett sat on the plane, he started to drink alcohol. And at the beginning, he would put the book away when he went to talk to people in first class. But eventually, he got careless. And he put the book on his seat when he walked into first class. And my sister leaned over and picked it up and handed it to me. And I wanted to make sure the guy next to me wasn't going to tell on us. <laughs> and it turns out he was from Northern Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> and uh, so we opened up the book, and he said, take the strategy. <laughs> So we took the strategy out of the book, and then we had stopped in, uh, in Calgary, and I happened to pick up a newspaper. And a lot of the chiefs know my sister and I and how we work. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so just when she was going to lean over and put the book back, there were two women who had long skirts on and they got up to go to the bathroom so she <coughs> leaned over and put the book back on the chair. And I took the, the strategy and I put it in the newspaper and I walked to the back and one of the chiefs was sitting there from Lillewood. So I handed him the paper and he already knew <laughs> what was going on. <coughs> and he uh, already mixed all the papers in with his papers. When we got to Ottawa, the first place we went was Walt's office. He showed up there, Reverend Opots came, and we went through the whole thing. And you know, a thousand people were in Ottawa, Indian people, that were given a hotel room to watch the Constitution talks. And every time Bill Bennett's face came up, everybody laughed. <laughs> so, I know Rary is here, and I'm really, really happy that he is. And I'm happy for all of you that the university is doing what it's doing. I want to thank Deborah Young, Susan Carvel, Margaret Amiot, and Brenda Peterson for getting me here today. Thank you all very much.
protected this. And this allows my father's work to continue uh, through your research, your interpretation, writing theses and, and papers. This knowledge will, will be disseminated and will be put on the record. As you know, those in power usually write the history. And, and, and this is Dad's way of making sure the truth is out there. Knowledge is power. And, uh, and this allows his work to continue. So this is uh, for us very, very important to see and to see an action through a very moving work. And that work we had to do was phenomenal and, uh, to organize all, all that material. And I understand there's already uh, students and postdocs swirling away uh, and, and making use of this material. And uh, there's a lot on the record there, from a uh, mystical point to uh, how the civilians <coughs> pattern of the apartheid system after the Canadian uh, way of doing business. Uh, to Vladimir Swanick, 
who was assisted by Andrea Martin, Jeanette Montford, and Tyne Petrowski for their Herculean task in working for nearly two years to get the material described. Um, and thanks to, to the many other staff members who were involved in making this collection av available as well. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Dr. Catherine Pettipaw in the wonderful curation of the exhibit on Walter. This exhibit will be up for the school year until the end of next April. And finally, we have an electronic exhibition um, different from this uh, curated exhibition behind me, and that is available online along with the Finding Aid to Walter's work. So we had worked closely, the archives itself had worked closely with Walter um, since it was alerted to his important collection by the son of our associate librarian at the time, Mike Angel, in 1997. But the last time I phoned Walter and asked if I could come and see him about his archives shortly before he died, his first response was, well, five other institutions want my archives, the University of Toronto, the University of Ottawa, York University. And then he paused and said, but you were the first, so you can come. And after we had talked together, um, I think is when he decided for sure that it was going to come here. I think his sense of fairness continued right to the end. Um, even before we advertised that we had the collection, researchers had started turning up from all over Canada to work on the records. I was astonished to walk in one morning and see five different scholars with their heads bent over Walter's records. And in fact, I just by chance, um, boxes were pulled uh, for one researcher and another researcher accidentally opened the box and said, hey, I didn't know this stuff was here. And uh, she ended up using material that she had no idea um, just by through uh, an accident. So I think Walter would be pleased at the response to his collection. So I'll end with a few words from Walter's daughter, Elaine Brudnicki, who's presently in Paris and who could not be with us today. She said, our father worked in the back office quietly, consistently, with the slow fire of revolt. He sought to inform and denounce, educate and inspire, so that Canada's native peoples could take their destinies in their own hands. Thanks to this poem, his life's work can continue to inform, educate and inspire future generations so that this battle of conscience can continue. So thank you all for coming. I invite you to stay. Um, if you haven't met the family, meet them, uh, share in uh, a little bunch, and get to know Walter and his work a little better. And um, on a prosaic note, we have a number of parking passes if anybody has parked in the parkade. And there was something else I was supposed to tell. Um, yes, what? The elevator. If oh, anybody yes. Um, if you did take the elevator up, um, you would actually, Marina will let, allow you down for security reasons. It's a key elevator, and uh, she'll be there to allow you uh, to get out again. <laughs> okay, thank you.